Hi there, it's Kirsty from Culture Wellness here, and today I'm going to show you how to use your Diversity Dough Culture Starter. Now the reason why I created this culture starter is because we know in the research at the moment that fiber and prebiotics and resistant starches are so important for your gut bacteria, for your gut microbiome, for producing energy and keeping your body ticking along and humming along beautifully. Now, when I first went through this journey of rebuilding and rebalancing my gut microbiome, I couldn't handle a lot of fiber and I couldn't handle a lot of sugars. And so I found it really hard to put the fiber into my diet, those resistant starches into my diet without having all of that pain and the bloating and a lot of the issues that come along with the imbalances of a gut microbiome. So what I have done is developed the Diversity Dough Culture Starter, which means that you can get all of that beautiful fiber, those resistant starches without the sugar that causes a lot of the problems, which means in the end that you can get about building that beautiful gut bacteria a lot quicker and you can do it in a way that you can make it at home, you can make an all sorts of things that are diversity of things like pizza doughs, breads, you can make little um, buns, you can make all sorts of things. You can do it at home, you can ferment it, and then you can share it with your family, your friends, and your community. So let's get started. Now you will receive your diversity dough culture starter in a pack delivered from Cultured Wellness, and that needs to be stored in the fridge. It will last about three months in the fridge. When you are ready to use it, take it out and warm it up until sort of, you know, room temperature. So I've got mine here. You can see that it's a dough-like consistency and it needs to be at room temperature. That's your starter. So pop that into a bowl. Now we're gonna add all the dry ingredients into your bowl. Now, I haven't just selected any old dry ingredients to go into this, it's all been done specifically to create a functional food that supports your body. Now, functional foods are foods that enable your body to have optimal nutrition, but they taste awesome. And so the first one that I'm gonna add in is the green banana flour. Now, green banana flour is absolutely incredible. It is really high in nutrients, but it is also got incredible resistant starch. So some people are concerned about the carbohydrate content of green banana flour, but we don't have to worry about that because we're gonna ferment all of this out. So I'm gonna add that green banana flour in there. The next thing that I'm going to add is the tiger nut flour. Now, once again, tiger nut flour has a huge amount of fiber in it, but it is not a nut. So don't freak out if you cannot handle nuts. It's actually a tuber. And so it's a vegetable from the ground and it's really, really low allergen, but it gives a wonderful texture to your cooking. So I'm gonna add this tiger nut flour in there. The next thing I'm going to add in is the ground flaxseed. Now, ground flaxseed is incredible for an array of reasons, but the reason why I like adding it in is because it's actually really good for creating that beautiful motility so we can move our stools through. It helps with excreting hormones, and it's also really good for bulking up your stools. So we're going to add that ground flaxseed in. Now, ground flaxseed can get rancid really quickly, so make sure you store it in the fridge and make sure that you buy a really reputable one um, and even if you wanna get some linseeds and then ground it down yourself or grind it down yourself, that's a good way to do it too. So I'm gonna pop that one in. Now, the next thing is slippery elm powder. We use this a lot at Culture Wellness for people on our programs to support soothing that gut lining and cooling down that inflammation. It is a wonderful, wonderful way to nurture your gut and support your gut. So we're gonna add that slippery elm in. The next thing is the psyllium husk. Now psyllium husk is wonderful for once again, bulking up that stool, giving that extra fiber that you need each day and also 
helping the dough to have that really nice, um, dense consistency. I'm gonna add some salt in as well. The salt is very important for the fermenting process and it also just tastes great. This is a salt that obviously has lots and lots of nutrients in it, so lots of minerals. Now the next thing I'm going to add in is the coconut flour. Now a lot of you might freak out about the coconut flour and it was certainly something that was a trigger for a lot of my irritable bowel symptoms because coconut flour still has quite a bit of sugar in it. It still has that fructose and it is really fibrous. But once again, when you ferment it like we are going to do, it takes away that sugar content turns it into a really easily digestible food, has that prebiotics, has that fiber, and is going to be a functional food for you, as opposed to an irritant or something that's really gonna upset your tummy. So we pop the coconut flour in there. Now, coconut flour is really dense and it requires a lot of water. So we'll get into that in a second. The last thing that I'm gonna put in there is the tapioca flour. Now this is also going to help bind it up and going to help create this perfect recipe. So I've popped that tapioca flour in there as well. So that is all your dry ingredients for this first step. Okay, so now we're going to add the water in. Now it's really important to use filtered water and the quantity of the water is all relative to what you are making. So at the moment I am making our basic diversity loaf and because it's got the coconut flour which absorbs lots of water, I'm going to use around this two cups of water. But if I wasn't using coconut flour and I was maybe making a pizza dough and using a hemp flour, I probably won't need as much water. So you've really got to be mindful of the water content and make sure you adjust it to what you're making and also the consistency. Now remember, this is a beautiful, functional food and it takes time and you've got to be at one with the food. So there's no hard and fast rules and you've got to watch it and work out what is going to work for the right consistency. Okay, so I might just stir this all through first. And obviously, I'm just going to break up this starter now and just put it all in separate little bits. And then I'm going to add the water. So I'm going to add, to start with, around about a cup because I want to see how much I need. I don't want to add too much and I don't want to add too little. It does get a little bit messy and that's fine because that's when you get your kids involved because they love it and get your hands in there. So I'm just gonna mix it up as much as I can with this spoon and then I'm gonna get my hands in there. Okay, now obviously, as we can see, I'll just pop that in the sink. As we can see, it's starting to form a beautiful dough. I'm gonna squeeze it, make sure that it's all going through. Now you can see from that that I'm going to need some more water. So I'm going to add some more water in there to get this consistency absolutely perfect. Good. <laughs> it's going everywhere. There we go. Now it's really starting to come together and form that beautiful dough. Okay, so it's almost at the right consistency. So I'm just gonna add that last little bit of water in there, get the right consistency. And during the fermenting process, the different flours, and especially that coconut flour, will grab hold of that water. And there we have it, the perfect dough, ready to go and ready to be fermented. So this is the consistency that you want. You want it to be a dough, but you want it to be a little bit wet, but obviously you want it to deform a dough. So we're not making a cake batter. We're not, um, you know, trying to, it doesn't need to be runny. We really want it to stick together and make it into a dough. So now we're gonna begin the fermenting process. And this is the beauty of using the diversity dough culture starter. 
Now the culture starter has 35 billion CFU in it. Now what that means is it's got an array, an abundance of beautiful bacteria that is going to activate and start this fermenting process. Now I've chosen specific strains for this culture starter that I know feed and activate and love fibre. So lots and lots of bifidobacterium strains and Saccharomyces boulardii, which is an incredible yeast that is wonderful for small intestinal issues. It's wonderful for supporting gut health. So with the fermenting process, that starter with those 35 billion CFU in there are gonna go about eating up all of the sugars and the carbohydrates in the flours that we've just put in there and turn it into this incredible resistant starch and prebiotic bomb that you are then going to cook and make this incredible loaf out of. So it's just such an incredible functional food and it's so wonderful for supporting your gut and also rebuilding your gut or if you've got imbalances. And so the beauty really is this fermenting part of the process. Now, when I ferment my dough, I ferment it for 48 hours. Now that's going to change. So once again, this is a functional food. You've got to watch the food, be part of the process and move with it and especially move with it with the seasons. So if it's winter time, it's going to be colder. And so the bacteria are going to struggle a little bit more in that colder environment to activate and ferment. And so it may take a little bit longer. In the summertime, that bacteria is warm, it's alive, it's thriving, and it actually may only take 24 hours. And so it will change with the seasons, it'll change with your particular household. Do you have the fire on at night that you can pop the dough next to the fire in the winter time? Or do you live in a tropical environment where there's some humidity, which is going to affect it too? So really take note of your environment and where you are fermenting. And in the winter time, do try and keep it nice and warm. So with the fermenting process, all you need to do is transfer it into a airtight container. Now that airtight container is very, very important. If oxygen gets in, it is going to disrupt the fermenting process. So make sure that you use a container that is airtight. Now the one that I've been using is this Pyrex one. So it's got a glass bottom, which is perfect. You don't want to ferment in plastic because the bacteria in the ferment does start eating the plastic and then you eat the plastic. So please, no, no plastics. So use that glass. And then I have um, found that this Pyrex one that's got, can you see there how it's got an actual beautiful seal that goes around there? that is just perfect for keeping it airtight for this fermenting process. So really all you need to do is grab your dough, pop it into your container and smooth it out and then pop the lid on. Hear that? That's the airtight. Pop the lid on, leave it out on the bench for that 48 hours, so don't touch it, leave it out on the bench for the 48 hours and then you'll be ready to come back and to bake your dough. So how do you know when your dough is ready? Now the first way that you'll know is by the smell. It will have that fermented smell about it. it, it it's a bit like a brewery, that kind of tart, sour, fermented smell. And that really is going to be the main way that you are going to know whether it's ready or not. So the smell and also it would have been fermenting for that 48 hours in those optimal conditions of about 18 to 22 degrees. And if it is colder than that, it will take longer. It will also have increased a little bit, just a little bit of rise in your um, container there but it's mainly the smell. You will really notice that change and that fermented smell. Alrighty, so your dough has been fermenting for the 48 hours depending on the weather. So let's have a look at it. 
Now, it is different than a traditional sourdough. A traditional sourdough, you'll see an increase and it will rise. And some other breads that you make, you will see it rise. This will a little bit, but because of the density of the flours and the density of the starter, don't expect this huge, big, you know, increase. That's okay. That's exactly what we expect. So just making sure that it's still the right consistency. If it's a bit dry, you can add a little bit more water to it and adjust it. So you want it to still be a dough, but not cracked and too dry. Now, what we need to do is set aside your starter for your next batch because your one diversity dough culture starter that you receive from us will make 10 batches. So that's either 10 loaves of something or 10 pizza doughs or whatever you wanna be making. Banana breads, blueberry breads, whatever. So you wanna make sure that you grab your starter for your next batch and set it aside. So once again, you need an airtight container and glass is best. So I've got this for a two cup Pyrex, so the 470 ml one. And once again, it's got a really nice seal on it. So then you take out 250 grams of your starter, which is probably around about that. I do measure mine, so um, make sure if you're a little bit unsure how much, you make sure you measure it. I pop it into the little container there, pop the lid on, and then you store that in the fridge until the next time you make something. So you store it in the fridge, airtight container, and if you aren't making anything for a while, that will last in the fridge as it's stored like that for around three months. Now you're gonna go through all of these things a lot quicker than that and be making things on the go. So you'll use it a lot sooner than that, but it will last for about three months. Alrighty, let's get started on making a loaf. So I've taken my dough out of my fermenting glass dish and just popped it back in here. I'm gonna add the final ingredients in and then we're going to bake it. So to have that dough rise a little bit in the oven, it's really ideal to add a little bit of apple cider vinegar on the top there, and then also add some bicarb. So the bicarb, make sure that it rises just that little bit. Okay, so mixing it all through. Now to me, this seems like it might be just a little bit to dry. So what I'm gonna do is just add the tiniest bit of water in there, just to make sure that it's the right consistency. And you can do that, just make sure that you adjust it to work for you and what's going on in your kitchen and making sure that the dough is the right consistency. So making sure that the bicarb is evenly distributed through Give it a nice knead and then we're going to transfer it into your baking tin. Now with regards to the baking tin, because this loaf is going to be very dense and it's not going to rise like an, a traditional bread or a traditional sourdough, you want to have a tin that is quite uh, small but high. So then when you slice your bread, when it's been cooked, it's a really nice, um, you know, high piece of toast or piece of bread. So this one here is a beautiful enamel. You wanna make sure that you're using low tox, so nothing with any coating on it. It's very, very important to make sure that we get the right baking trays and baking dishes. Okay, so you can see there that I've just pressed it all down. Nothing very technical about that, just pressed it all in there. And then it's ready to go. Now, that is the basic loaf. But in this process where I am now, um, you could add some eggs in there to give it some lightness. You could throw in some blueberries. You could put in some fermented bananas. You could add some olives with some herbs to make a savory olive and herb loaf. Really, 
It is absolutely endless what you can do and this is the process that you will do it in. I've left it egg free because I know there's lots of people that during their healing journey they cannot have eggs. But if you can have eggs, I highly recommend that when you make your dough at this point, you do put the eggs in there. It does give extra texture to the loaf and helps it to bind together. So if you can handle eggs, whack a couple of eggs in, either two to four eggs, so you're ready to cook it and it will just give it that extra oomph that you need with your loaf. So now it's ready to go in the oven. I am going to cook this on a very low temperature of around about 140 degrees Celsius and it needs to cook for at least three hours, sometimes four hours. Now that low and slow method is very, very important because it's dense. There's so much resistant starch in there. There's so much fiber in there. It does take time to ensure that you can cook it all the way through. So in my oven, it does take around four hours. Now that may seem like a long time to cook something, but in traditional artisan food, functional food, when you're looking at traditional sourdoughs, it does normally take around that time. It's just that we're so used to this speedy, have something out and half an hour and off we go. So we've just got to go back to that low and slow method. So normally for me, in the rhythm of my household, I would quickly whip this up at around about five or six o'clock whilst I'm organizing dinner for the kids. And then I just have it cooking away on a slow and low heat. And then by the time I'm ready to go to bed, I just pull it out and then it's all done. So it doesn't really, you know, um, cause me any bother during my day. And it is a beautiful rhythm that we've got into with cooking our loaf. Now I often get asked, okay, so you fermented this, your um, dough. What happens to all that beautiful bacteria that was in that starter culture that has turned it into this incredible prebiotic resistant starch you know, formula that you've got here. What happens to that during the cooking process? Doesn't all the bacteria die off in the cooking process? Now, the answer to that is, when you're cooking on a low temperature, you do actually maintain a lot of the integrity of that bacteria. Some definitely will die off and that's fine because the whole point of this beautiful loaf or this diversity dough is around that prebiotics, the resistant starches and that fiber. So that's really what's the beauty of this functional food. Not so much the bacteria like the culture wellness yogurt or the culture wellness kefir. It's all about the fiber and the resistant starches but you'll be really surprised. It does maintain some of that bacteria because of that low and slow cooked method. So keep it low, cook it for that long period of time. So I'm just gonna whack it in the oven. Alrighty, so it's in the oven and it's gonna be cooking for about four hours. So here's one that I made yesterday. Now, it's a lot shorter than it, what it should be. It's because my kids got stuck into it this morning before school without me knowing. So just to imagine that it's a little bit wider, a little bit longer, but see how nice and brown it is on the outside. But what I really wanna show you is that it is still quite dense and doughy on the inside. And that's really important for you to know because that's exactly what we want it to be. It's a functional food, it's a dense food. We want those resistant starches and those fibers in there. And so this is what you would expect from your bread. Now, I always serve it toasted. So I would cut it up, pop it in the toaster, so it browns up all over like this one. And then it's absolutely amazing to have with, you know, smashed avocado, cashew cheeses, anything like that. Now, when it comes out of the oven, it, if you slice it, it will be doughy and dense still on the inside. It may even stick to your knife and that's fine. It's what we expect. 
please don't slice it warm. Now I know that's really hard because hot warm bread is the best thing ever, but you need it to cool down so then you can slice it because of the density of the dough on the inside. But I, because I love it warm, will cut the little end off of it and have that little bit and that's fine. But you really want to make sure it cools down before you cut it. Another little tip that may help you that I often do is around about and you know one hour left in the cooking process, I actually take it out of the oven and I take it out of the tin and I flip it over and put it back in the oven again. I actually take it out, flip it over and put it on a baking tray and put it back in. So then you are cooking it from the bottom down as well. So that's just something that I've started to do that just seems to get that really consistent cooking the whole way through. Okay, so now you've made your loaf, you can either store it in the fridge for around about a month or you can store it in the freezer for three months. Now, if you store it in the freezer, I highly recommend that you cut it into slices and then pop it in an air, airtight container and put it in the freezer. It's much easier to grab it that way, defrost it, toast it, and off you go. So how much of this diversity loaf or whatever you've made should you be eating? Now that really is dependent on where you are at with regards to your gut, your health, and your healing journey. So if you have imbalances in your gut, if you have irritable bowel problems, autoimmune conditions, those sorts of things, please start slow. This is a functional food. It is a very healing, powerful food like our cultures are. And so you wanna start very, very small. So maybe a half a slice just to get you started and see what happens. Now, when our lab results came back for our diversity loaf and our diversity doughs, it, there was zero sugar in there and the carbohydrates that were left behind were resistant starch and so it's going to be wonderful for insulin, it's going to be wonderful for blood sugar control, all of those sorts of things. So really, if you have a robust gut, how much you should have in a day is very dependent on your activity levels and also dependent on your metabolic flexibility. So how much carbohydrate can you have? So that's really up to you. But I would say at least a slice a day, maybe two. But it's a wonderful way to get that fiber in without having to have powders and having to have all of these supplements. It's a functional food. It is the best way to get these in. So there you have it. That is how to use your diversity dough culture starter to make that basic loaf. But of course, there is so many options and so many other things that you can do with your culture starter to ferment out all these incredible ingredients so you have optimal gut health, lots of fiber in your day, lots of resistant starches. So please check out the extra recipes on our website and make sure that you send me some photos, tag Culture Wellness, let me know what you're making and how it's going for you. Thanks and I'll see you soon.